Hey everyone, Crazy here. Welcome to your weekly space hangout for Friday, December the 11th, 2015. Uh, today we got a ton of really good stories. We're going to be talking about uh, a new super Earth, Nibiru Planet X, here in the solar system. Perhaps a neutron star barreling its way towards us. It's going to flip the magnetic. Anyway, we'll get on to that. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the Whipple Observatory, likely spots for life in the Milky Way, nano satellites from NASA, uh, the uh, the Japanese spacecraft that just arrived at Venus, which we will mangle the name a bunch of times. Uh, maybe an answer about what those white spots are on Ceres. Finally. Uh, we're going to talk about the 2015 Geminids and a couple of uh, interesting Cygnus-related launches and uh, and uh, docking. So, uh, joining us this week, we've got, let's see, I'm going to go alphabetically, Dave Dickinson. David. Hey. Different day, different hotel room. So. <laughs> I'm I'm always impressed at your ability to get hotel Wi-Fi to bring you to our show. This one, it's working pretty good this time. Yeah. I can't can tether to the blog. blog. <laughs> yeah. You should start a blog, yeah. yeah. I've heard Dave's of Dave's Wi-Fi yeah. reviews. <laughs> uh, we got Kimberly Cartier. Hey, Kimberly. Hey, Frazier. And we've got Morgan Renberg. Hey, Morgan. Good to be here. We've got Ramin Skiba. Hey, Ramin. Good to be back. Yay. And our special guest, and I'm super excited about this, is uh, someone who has been in the space journalism uh, world for as long as I have, or perhaps I think you were doing this job before I was doing this job. Maybe. We've got Carolyn Collins-Peterson, a.k.a. the space writer. Hey, Carolyn, welcome to hey. the Space Hangout. How hey. on earth have we not had you here before? I don't know. I've been here. Dave. <laughs> There the whole time, but not yes, here. Yeah, yeah. Well, save the best for last. <laughs> or for later. Well, well, I hope this isn't the last time. So for mm -hmm. anyone who has no idea who you are, uh, why don't you give us your, your intro, and then we'll, we'll uh, talk a bit about your, your career and, and what you're working on. All right. Now, you went the two-minute elevator speech, right? All right. Yes, as you said, I am Carolyn Collins-Peterson. I uh, am the space writer. Um, the interesting behind that is actually I'm space writer on Twitter, but when I went to buy my domain name, space writer was taken by these people that have these little lights that you shine up in the air and it writes words, you know, the space writer. So I had to become the space writer. Anyway, I've been a science writer since 19. Yeah, I don't think I want to say. Um, I started working at the Denver Post as a as a science writer quite a long time ago, and then went back to journalism school to actually get the degree, and at the same time studied astronomy, astrophysics, and science at the University of Colorado. So after that, I went to uh, Sky and Telescope magazine for a while. All the while, I was working on another career parallel to that, which was writing planetarium shows, and that is among the planetarium community what I'm best known for. Nowadays, we call it writing full dome immersive shows. So I do that. I write books. I write. Uh, I just write all kinds of stuff about science. Right now, now we don't have to say how long you've been doing this, but I started Universe Today back in 1999. That's when I started as a space journalist, and I know you were already sort of in in the business, as you said. You were already a, a science reporter. Yeah, so. I think I think my first blog was when I was in graduate school at CU, and that might have been in the. I'm going to say 1991, two, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it was you, me, and Phil and Alan Boyle. I think were. Oh yeah, were there were the, like three of us. Yeah. Right, and Phil was still a graduate student. He was the baby astronomer, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um. So yeah. so let's so I mean, let's talk about some of the stories that you've been sort of working on and and reporting on, even just in the last couple of uh, last couple of weeks. What are you focused okay. on? Well, um, one thing I didn't mention is for about the last year and a half, I've been the, the space and astronomy expert for about.com. And they, br they brought me in. They had a lot of stories in there that were older, and they wanted to have new stories in there. So I've been slowly chipping away at rewriting the old ones and then putting in new ones. And recently, for that and for my own blog and for other things that I write, I've been most interested in the comet Rosetta and also... Um, Pluto, obviously, Pluto. Alan Stern is a graduate school friend of mine, and so I've been following Pluto quite a bit. And I write, I think if you look at my blog, thespacewriter.com, and go to the blog, you'll see a period of time from July through about September when that's all I wrote about. And then in late September, my father died, and I didn't write for about a month and a half. So that was a little tough. But Pluto, little, little solar system bodies, that sort of thing, have really been uh, keeping my attention focused. 
And have you been seeing the the latest images still coming back from New Horizons? The new oh yeah, thing? I check every week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so what, you know, what Alan, Alan, Alan gets on Facebook and says, "Hey, if you like this? Look at this." You know, you can't help it. <laughs> yeah. So. so so what what aspects of this mission has gotten you most excited? You know, it's really to be honest, it's not the planet. It's the fact that somebody I knew did this. There are so many people on that team who I went to graduate school with, or were at the University of Colorado, still are. And it was like, these are my buds, and they did this. They went to Pluto. So getting to Pluto, the thing that really probably has excited me the most is trying to figure out if there were geysers there. For a while, we talked about whether or not there were things steaming out from below the surface. Now you look at the ice makeup there, you look at the chemical makeup, and you think, OK, here's what's going on here. Now what's making that happen below? And you don't have to have a lot of heating underneath to do that. You, you just have to have some sort of heating. Plus, you have all the solar insulation. So like the latest picture that just came out that had the little pits on it, that one just, just blew me away. I just spent about a half an hour looking at that image, That's that whole strip. And one of the stories that we're going to be talking about a bit is Ceres and those cool white spots yeah. on, on Ceres. And you had sort of an anecdote about that before we started. Oh, yeah. Um, so I just finished writing a script for a, a show called Edge of Darkness, which is for Evans and Sutherland Corporation. Uh, they they produce planetarium shows, full dome shows, and they also did the, what's called the Digistar. And so uh, Terrence came to me, he's the producer, and said, I want you to write this show. And one of the objects that we're writing about, well, we write about many things. There were asteroids, meteors, uh, Pluto, Ceres, Vesta, Characlo. And uh, Ceres, I was just sweating it towards the end because the script had to go in right about the time of the DPS meeting, which is about three weeks ago. And all I had in there for series was something's happening. <laughs> we didn't really know what. I mean, we knew something's going on. So I kind of went out on a limb. I talked to some people who were at DPS, and I, I told Terrence, give me a day, another day. I just need to talk to some people. So I called my friends, and they said, well, they're talking about salts. And so I said, okay, good, I can just say that. And so I wrote in there that we think that these are salts, there may be some geysering action, you know, what's going on to deposit those? And then I turned the script in, and just yesterday or the day before, they came out and said, ah, magnesium salt. So I'm vindicated. <laughs> I was really sweating it there for a while. And we'll get, we'll get more details about this discovery shortly sure, when, we, sure. get to, yeah, uh, when yeah. we get to Morgan. So so uh, um, so I'd like to talk about about planetarium shows because sure. I mean we've all you know as super space nerds we've all attended our share of planetarium shows. I'd love to know uh, some of us even do talks at planetariums as well. I'd love mm -hmm. to know um, what goes into doing a planetarium show. Well, it's changed a lot since I first started. When I was first doing these, we were doing slideshows. So you had to pace your narration and your delivery time so that you gave time for all of your slide projectors to change their visuals. Now, of course, we have video. And video changes everything. When you write a script, you're still telling a story. You're still, you know, as I like to say, keep it simple, stupid. It's the story, everything. So I have to figure out a story. And Terrence, for example, came to me with a story already. And they already, in fact, had a lot of visuals done. Most of the visualizations now are just that, video visualizations, and they're based on space data from, from wherever, you know, whatever uh, spacecraft or uh, Hubble Space Telescope or whatever, that goes in there. There are people in the community who do visualization work. I'm not an animator. I'd love to be one, but I don't have the time to be able to learn to do it, so I hire animators, or, hire, or animators are hired for me. Um, sometimes I write the script first, and then they animate to that. Other times they come to me and it's nearly all animated and I'm basically writing to pictures. So it's more like news writing in a lot of ways. Um, so, so there's that. And, and how, how many of these have you done now? You know, I had to count that up the other day. I think more than 60. 60 I different planetary shows. 60 different planetary shows for different clients plus for our own company, Loch Ness Productions. We have... 12 that we've done, but we've also then had clients that have hired us to do other shows for them. So, for example, we had somebody from Spain come to us and say, we'd like to take our show and turn it into American English. And I ended up nearly rewriting the whole thing and then, and uh, also narrating it. And do you find that the that the audiences these days are, are different from, you know, thanks to the Internet and thanks to social media and things like that, and people are maybe more aware or less aware? How, how, is, how have audiences changed since you've been um, working on these? Well, I think the audiences are more savvy about what's out there. Yeah, we, we can all go on the Internet and look at the latest Hubble pictures or the latest thing from Rosetta or whatever. 
Um, what you still need to do for audiences, and this is true whether it was back in ancient Greece or today, is tell a good story, and they expect that. And audiences are amazingly in touch with crappy content. They'll tell you. They'll let you know. Um, one way or the other, if you're just sitting there and you're watching a show, none of mine, if this hadn't happened to any of mine, but I've been at festivals where shows have shown and the visualization might be really great, but the script or narration or something isn't, or the story doesn't hang together, or the story's great, but the visuals don't work. And you can tell by the, just the posture of the audience and the way they're, they're talking when they go out, you know, how they feel about it. Yeah. Um, so what are you working on, like, right now? Right now, I am. I just finished the script for Edge of Darkness, and I'm waiting for the narration to come to me. I don't think they've announced who it is, but it's a famous Hollywood actor, so I can't say who it is, but, but it's somebody good. Um, but I just, I've been working for about the last year with a lady named Padma Yanamandra Fisher, who heads up the Professional Amateur Collaboration in Astronomy. And that's a group of people who go out, they're amateur astronomers, and they go out and they observe things and they send back images. Um, it's very familiar work to me because when I was in graduate school, I worked on the International Halley Watch. Tells you when that was. <laughs> And uh, we actually had images coming in from amateurs around the world. And it was at a time when nobody in the professional community thought amateurs could do this work. And they were sending in these stunningly gorgeous images. So my job with PACA, which is what we're calling it, is to take the best observations that we have. And I created one video already for them that will be, I think, on a NASA website fairly soon of just the images. And then starting fairly soon, even probably right now, I'm going to be working on picking up the best images and coming up with an electronic album that can be posted. And so we have hundreds and hundreds of images from people around the world of comet, uh, of all the comets that have been up recently. Churyumov, Gerasimenko, uh, Lovejoy, I mean, you name it, it's out there. Yeah, it's, it's just amazing how good the quality of the oh, yeah, amateur yeah. astrophotography yeah. is these days. Uh, we've got a pool on Flickr that, that people post and we sort mm -hmm. of pull from that. There's 32,000 pictures now that everybody has posted wow, to this wow. Flickr pool. Yeah. Pictures of, you know, and they're all, I mean, we could run them all on mm -hmm. Universe Today. It's crazy how, how Well, well one of the things there. we do with these guys is we ask them to, they have certain rules they have to follow about naming conventions and filtering and what time we want them to look. Uh, because we're trying to track action in the comet, and they do it. They go out and do it. And they, I mean, we have a guy on a mountaintop in Spain who just sends the most amazing pictures. His name is Tony Angel. Does amazing work. But there are many, many others who also do the same. And so I look at these images and go, "Wow, how am I going to? Which ones do I leave out? They're so good." So yeah, what else am absolutely. I working on? I'm about to work on a, start another full dome show for our company, uh, based on Hubble images, and we're still sort of in the pre, I guess, pre-production on that. And I just found out today that I'm getting a contract in the mail for a project about the history of space exploration for a group in England. And, and so I'll be announcing more about that once I get the contract. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm, it's just us right here. Uh, yeah, nobody's watching. Okay. That's okay. Uh, um, cool. So we're going to switch and we're going to cover. There's a ton of big news cool. that we're going to cover this week. So you want to stick around and sure. and uh, and chime in with some of the stuff. Uh, so, but before uh, we get onto that, just want to remind people how they can find out more about you. So they can follow you on Twitter, right, at Space mm -hmm. Writer, and they can check out your website. The well, Space I have several Writer. websites. TheSpaceWriter.com. My uh, company is Loch Ness Productions, uh, all three words, LochNessProductions.com. And we just recently started a new service where we're streaming full dome content to smaller planetariums across the web. So th there's a link to that as well. Oh, that sounds great. Okay, cool. Well, let's get on with some of the, uh, some of the big news. So I'm going to, today, I think I'm going to go in reverse alphabetical order. Uh, and I'm going to talk to Ramin first. Uh, Ramin, let's talk about the most likely spots for life in the Milky Way. Sure. This is um, some exciting research that um, I just wrote about for Science Magazine, my, my first story for science. Nice um, work. Yeah, thank you. I'm pretty uh, proud of it. Took, took a lot of work. Um, and uh, it's, it's a study by, uh, led by a Scottish astronomer named Duncan Forgan, um, and it's in a journal of astrobiology. I think it'll probably come out in January, but it's, it's available online. What they did was they used a very detailed simulation of uh, not just the Milky Way, but of, uh, of going beyond the Milky Way, so it includes uh, Andromeda Galaxy and some other galaxies. It's, it, they basically tried to do this simulation that approximately reproduces, um, it, it looks like the, like the Milky Way Andromeda in, in a number of ways. And then they trace it back over billions of years. And so then what they did in this fairly realistic simulation 
was see um, basically uh, what kinds of uh, what kinds of places would habitable planets most likely form uh, depending on what kinds of uh, natural hazards are there. And and by hazards, they focus mo mostly on supernovae. So if a uh, if a star a dying star explodes too close to say our solar system, then uh, the um, you could basically fry off our ozone layer, and then everyone would be exposed to UV radiation. Um, doesn't matter how much uh, <laughs> how much sunscreen you have, we're, we basically are all in trouble. And so, uh, if so, so basically, in the center of the galaxy, where you have lots and lots of stars, there's a higher chance of a planet getting uh, exposed to this kinds of radiation. And so, although there will be, um, at least according to their predictions, there will be some habitable planets there the chance of any given planet being habitable is just much, much lower um, in the center of the galaxy. And so their key findings are that as you go towards the edge of the galaxy, so basically our distance from the center um, and, and further out in the, in the spiral arms, you're more, the planets are more likely to be uh, life-friendly. And, and not just that, also uh, like uh, nearby small galaxies, which they call satellites, um, like the Magellanic Clouds, um, and, and streams of star, like the Man Magellanic Stream, because those are more diffuse, they're less dense, the, those two can have like little pockets of, of habitable planets. So it's, so it's really cool stuff. It's sort of really early on for this field, but it's kind of pointing, pointing in, the, in that direction, I would say. So this would help, for example, like the SETI searches to sort of narrow down which actual worlds they're looking at? Exactly, yeah. So I think, um, so with future telescopes... Um, so maybe not with Kepler, but but maybe uh, say with Gaia and um, TESS. I forgot what that stands for. Um, and, and maybe maybe the next generation. When when each search is so expensive, you know, each each hour of time is so expensive, you kind of need to um, focus the search in, in a sense. And so I think this this could potentially guide um, the SETI searches. Sounds great. Although the you know the distance that we can actually see these planets with the modern techniques, you know, you can only see a few thousand light years out at the, at the most. So that's all still within yeah. our kind of our neighborhood. Right. But yeah. Uh, so, so, so yeah, it might take a, a while before we could see those more distant uh, planets, but, yeah. but it's where we should look for evidence of Dyson spheres. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, so some, some people are actually thinking about that stuff. Like what kinds of signal, like a radio signal, would a Dyson yeah. sphere give off? Oh, they've um, already done surveys, infrared oh, surveys really? of looking for mm -hmm. Dyson spheres and even looking for uh, galaxies which have turned into type 3 civilizations where they've pretty much turned their entire, every star in their entire galaxy into a Dyson sphere because that whole galaxy would give off a different kind of infrared signature than a regular galaxy. Uh, none, none have turned up. Yeah, the the That's study really you're cool. talking about, Fraser, was actually done by uh, the same guy over here at Penn State who did the alien megastructure mm -hmm. research recently. Uh, my advisor does a lot of does a lot of that study work. That's great. I would love to talk to talk to him and get some more good story ideas. I'll see if I can recruit him to come on the show. That would be awesome. Uh, cool. All right. Well, let's move on. Uh, Morgan, let's talk about those white spots on the series. Yeah, Carolyn kind of spoiled the uh, build up to this story, but over the course of really the last year, we've been tracking uh, these spots on series that are coming better and better and better into focus as the Dawn spacecraft slowly approaches. Uh, and this week, there are actually two big uh, papers published in uh, the journal Science that revealed information about the surface of Ceres. Uh, and the first was, in fact, about these spots. And as Carolyn alluded to, these spots aren't uh, ice maybe left over from um, cryovolcanic activity like many uh, were maybe hoping for, but instead um, they're deposits of salt on the surface. And this makes a lot more sense to us as scientists because ice on the surface of Ceres is going to sublimate away rather rapidly. And the question we had to grapple with was, why were we so lucky that we pulled up at Ceres and suddenly there's ice on the surface? Uh, salt, on the other hand, can last for a very long time. Uh, and what likely happened was that there was once ice, uh, salty ice, on the surface of Ceres. And, and over time, that ice sublimated away and left the salt behind. And this is sort of exactly like allowing water to evaporate, say, in a bowl, and any 
salts and dirt and stuff that's left in that bowl after the water evaporates is going to cling to the surface and form kind of a little crusty um, crusty bit. And that's what we're looking at here uh, all over series. Uh, so you could, like, scrape this up and then sell it as artisanal series <laughs> asteroid salt? You probably could. That might be a target for uh, future asteroid miners. I'm going to put that on my um, Etsy page. <laughs> and, hey, Morgan, Morgan yeah. why is it so bright? Uh, so it actually isn't that bright. It turns out that Ceres itself is incredibly dark. And this is what we don't uh, often think about when we're looking in the outer solar system, is how incredibly dark these things. The actual true color of Ceres uh, has been described as about that as freshly laid asphalt. Uh, so it only reflects 3 to 5% of the light that hits it. Uh, this salt is... Uh, about the brightness of sort of your average table salt, it reflects about half the light that hits it. So in order to take these pretty pictures in which we can see the craters and the ridges and all of that stuff, we really have to drive up the contrast. Yeah, yeah. And anything that's then relatively bright gets so uh, blown out that it looks like it starts to glow. Yeah, um, I think it's important happened. for people to understand, this right, is that it's not, it's um, not lasers zapping off of the surface <laughs> of Ceres. It is, you know, something that's a little more lighter on top of something that's incredibly dark. Yeah. So that was one of the two papers, and it gives us a hint of some of the recent history of Ceres. These, these uh, impacts create these craters that release ice that then sublimates away and leaves this salt behind. Uh, but another paper that came out in the same issue of Science analyzed the actual surface of Ceres and found that it was uh, very rich in uh, ammonium-based clays. Mm -hmm. And this was pretty surprising to researchers because at the distance from the sun that Ceres orbits, uh, it's too warm for ammonia to uh, exist in just sort of its normal state. And so if you go back four and a half billion years, there wouldn't have been ammonium around, ammonia around to form these ammonia-based clays uh, at the location of Ceres today. Uh, and it also revealed that Ceres has a higher content of water within these these clay-based surface, then meteorites coming from the same area that we have here on Earth. And when you put these two pieces of information together, we have two um, volatile gases that shouldn't be able to exist where Ceres is today. That tells us that Ceres almost certainly formed much farther out in the solar system and then migrated inwards. And this fits within the picture that we have today of the notion that solar systems form in one place and then they move to take up uh, another place. And if we can understand the conditions in which uh, an object like Ceres formed, we can better understand where these kinds of objects must have been during that original period of formation. And that's a really important uh, constraint on any attempt then to simulate uh, how these planets moved subsequent to that. Wow. Uh, well, I'm... I'm really glad that we got a pretty good answer now at this point. I mean, we've been, anyone's been watching the show for the last couple of, I guess the last, you know, last year since these white spots turned up, is we're, you know, uh, we have no idea what this is. It could be geysers, could be salt, could be ice on the surface, probably not alien laser beams, but, um, and, and now we've got an answer. So you just watch this happen, everybody. This is how the science happens. We go from the, best picture, the best pictures are yet to come. Yeah, uh, yeah series, or I'm uh, sorry, Dawn just uh, took up its closest mapping orbit uh, in the last couple of weeks and intends to begin mapping the surface of Ceres uh, at a resolution of about 30 meters per pixel uh, mm. in, in the coming months. And so think of the best pictures of these spots that you've seen up till now, and you're going to see dramatically better pictures going forward. That's great. I think it's amazing that Ceres and Pluto have gone this year from being dots to really real worlds in, in the public consciousness now. It's, it's as if we need to send spacecraft to all the other dots. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. If, you, if they needed any kind of incentive, they've got it now. Um, okay, well, let's move on. Uh, so, Kimberly, let's talk about yeah. uh, the, the terrifying super-Earth in the outer <laughs> limits of our, of our solar system, <laughs> barely yeah, right. on Earth. Is this, is this a dawning of a new age? Is there going to be a pole flip? No. Okay. No. Uh, so the terrifying super-Earth at the edge of the solar system... Uh, has already gotten blown a little bit out of proportion as well, though not not as far as the alien megastructures have, I, I will say. So this this idea of there may be a larger planet out at the edge of the solar system has been around for a very long time, 
And if you ask most scientists, they'll say, of course not. There is no other planet, lar large planet, outside of Neptune. There are, of course, thousands of little icy worlds, just like Pluto. But if there was anything really big outside of Neptune, we would have seen it by now. Well, there were two papers that were uh, recently released this week that seemed to challenge that notion. Um, both of the scientific teams were using uh, images that came from the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, or ALMA, which looks at very long wavelengths of light. And one of them in particular was looking, they were looking out in the direction of Alpha Centauri A and B to try and figure out if there were planets around those stars. Uh, that has also been a very recently contentious claim as well, and they were trying to prove that one way or another, and instead they saw a spurious bit of light that they were really not expecting to see. And they, they said, okay, that's really interesting. They went back about a month later to take more observations of Alpha Centauri, and they saw that that speck of light had moved quite a bit. And now when we see a large uh, a speck of light that moves across the sky over a short period of time, we know that it must be moving really fast because the farther away something is, the slower it appears to move. So if it's moving really fast and it moves a great distance in your images, then it must be moving really fast and therefore must be pretty close. And after ruling out quite mm. a few uh, other ideas, they settled on this idea that it either must be a brown dwarf that is probably about halfway between our Sun and the Alpha Centauri system, or something even smaller like a super Earth or uh, a sub Neptune type planet that's uh, about half again as far as Pluto is from the Sun. And this made quite a splash, and immediately a, a number of astronomers put on their skeptical hats and said, well, no, probably not. That's probably not what it is. One, because we probably would have seen it by now, if it truly was. Um, there's also the issue the, that Alma has an incredibly small field of view, and over two observations it's very highly unlikely that they would have chanced upon the one planet out there that we haven't seen yet in an incredibly small field of view out of the entirety of the night sky. And so either they got incredibly lucky and caught it on the first try, or there are thousands and thousands of these out there so that essentially anywhere they looked they would have seen one. The issue with both of those is that if there was any planet larger than the Earth really larger than something like Mercury or Pluto even, uh, that was out there in the Kuiper Belt or the Oort Cloud, it would have radically destabilized all these small icy worlds by now. And our solar system probably wouldn't exist anymore if such a thing actually existed. Most likely what this is, is either a, another small Kuiper Belt object like Pluto or like Sedna that just happens to be a bit brighter than normal, maybe through something like having extra salt on the surface like Ceres does, mm -hmm. or it could even be something like an extra galactic source, something far outside of the Milky Way that just happens to be flaring and appears a bit brighter now and goes on and off, something like that. But if I understand correctly, astronomers, some astronomers, um, I think it was a Mexican astronomer who has been predicting uh, that there are going to be either a Mars-sized object relatively close by or a Neptune-sized object much further out by the movements of the Kuiper Belt objects and sort of, the, you know, that, they're, that they're, their positions are a little different from where they should be. And so, you know, there's something larger that's out there, but it's just beyond the limits of our, of our observation. Mm -hmm. But it can kind of narrow down the search. But That has been one of the theories because a lot of the trans-Neptunian objects have very highly elliptical orbits. And so you say, oh, it's something has an orbit that is, doesn't appear too normal, then something must have changed it. There must have been some interaction, and it, it would have to be a planet that is so large and at such a distance, but we really haven't seen any evidence that something like that exists. It really would stir up the pop too much in the outer solar system. Well, and wouldn't you also have to take into account any interactions in the past as well with exactly. Jovian planets? Yeah. So. Yeah. The, the fact that Jupiter and Saturn, like Morgan said, have likely moved around quite a bit since yeah, they formed. Yeah. 
we know that that has happened, and that's a much more likely explanation, is that there was some interaction with Jupiter and Saturn in the very distant past that mm. modified these orbits. Or, yeah. or maybe, you know, you just do happen to get lucky when you're making an observation and you yeah. see an you object do. that's very puzzling yeah. Yeah. and makes you wonder if it's perhaps some kind of alien superstructure or... I'm Earth never going to get, get, get away never. from that, am I? Never. <laughs> Not yeah, the, 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 Nibiru, the Nibiru crowd's already wound up about this one. That's where I first heard mm -hmm. about the story this week and somebody saying, hey, they but, discovered Nibiru finally. But doesn't this yeah. mean that, that we now we have them in, a, in an intractable, logical trap? Because they're accepting observations from an astronomer yeah. to make this yeah. discovery in that, you know, as opposed to all of the, you know, none of the astronomers have seen any of the objects that they've been talking about, their sun dogs and things like that, but now they're taking the observations from an astronomer, some kind of confirmation bias, and then when it gets overturned, that's it. Their, their theories right. are done. They'll have no so, ability to make these so kinds of predictions. So you're admitting that Big NASA is not covering it up. <laughs> Big NASA is not covering it up. I, I, That's I, true. But... I forget what my talking points are that I'm supposed to say today. <laughs> yeah. It was with the check, and I'm going to have to just check mm -hmm. it out again. Um, well, oh, uh, one last note is that it's it's important to realize that the, both, uh, neither of these stories have yet been peer-reviewed. Mm -hmm. So they were posted on an open source paper archive. It's a very common thing that astronomers do to share their work with people who don't have access to the paywall journals. Uh, these were posted before they were accepted into any peer-reviewed journal, and they still have to undergo a very rigorous review process before the astronomical community accepts it. Okay, but Kimberly, worst case scenario, let's say that there is a super Earth-sized world orbiting in the very distant reaches of the solar system in a, you know, fairly normal orbit as it has been doing for billions of years. Sure. How long have we got? Well, I would say that if it if we have survived with it there for four and a half billion years, chances are pretty good we're not going to die in the next few years because of it. Would you say we've got billions? I would say, well, you know, we got another four and a half billion years okay. to go before something catastrophic happens. Okay, all right. Well, then everyone... Everyone can just sort of take that prediction when they decide how they much, yeah, yeah, how much uh, ammunition <laughs> and food they have to stockpile. Sure. Um, Nibiru is right out there, just where it always was, very slowly moving in a just outside our place. reach. Just outside our reach. We can take it place. with the grain of of serious salt. Yeah. <laughs> what a grain of serious salt! Awesome. <laughs> All right, That's wonderful. Now, uh, Dave, but the sky is actually falling. Dave it is. So, it's one, one of the prime meteor showers for 2015, prime annual meteor showers, peaks this weekend, the uh, annual December Geminid meteors. And this shower has actually been intensifying, and what's kind of interesting, this shower really wasn't known of. The first earliest records we had was from 1860. Observers started to notice we were getting what they call a zenithal hourly rate of about 10 to 15, right around December 13th and 14th. In the 20th century, it picked up to about 60 to 50 per hour. Lately, we've been seeing the Geminids produce well over. Last year, it had a very brief peak, about 250 per hour. Mm -hmm. It seems like we're going toward, uh, it's already outstripped the Perseids, and I think it would be more popular than the Perseids had it not, does it not occur in the wintertime for Northern Hemisphere viewers. Not as many people want to, I mean, here in Florida, it's 80 degrees, so I mean, we can go out and watch, but... It's, I know it's colder up north for people to go out, and the uh, astronomy becomes more of a cyber pursuit this time of year. It's, than it's a just lot of people cloudy. Don't. Well, that's yeah. true for some of them, but not for us. We'll go out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I go out. I, I lived up in Maine and Alaska for, like, years. Mm -hmm. I, I would go out in 40 below. I went out one time. I had the focuser and my telescope froze. It was so cold one Ooh. time. But, it's, uh, but still, it's uh, the Geminids are one definitely worth watching. I watched these from Mars Hill, North Carolina, in the Smoky mm -hmm. Mountains in 2012. It was very dark out there. Mm -hmm. And what's really cool is this radiant is high enough, and the meteors are hitting the Earth's atmosphere at an oblique enough angle that you'll start seeing activity. Most meteor showers you've got to watch past uh, midnight, cause it, you know, because the Earth is moving forward in its orbit then and kind of scooping up the stream. The Geminids is one that it starts activity around usually 10 p.m., 11 p.m. local time, and then it picks up after midnight a little bit. But, but you can start seeing these early on in the evening. So it's the one I saw in 2012. It was uh, they were coming along one every few minutes or so, so it was pretty intense. I'll probably go out 
tomorrow morning and start watching, and then I'll watch. Sunday morning is the yep. Sunday is the key time, uh, right? And the around. moon's going to cut us a break, right? Yes, the moon. Actually, thanks for reminding me. Yeah, the moon. Yeah. The moon is three is three days past new, I believe it is Sunday morning. So it's going to be out of the sky, pretty much. It's a waxing crescent, very thin crescent. So it's we're not going to have to worry about the light pollution from that. So this is nearly optimal. Usually, if you have a year that the Perseids are optimal, uh, the Leonids, Orionids, they're spaced just right on the calendar uh, with the, the lunar cycle that all the meteor showers will be. So it, it's not your imagination. It's not your imagination to think, wow, this is, the moon's been full on every meteor shower this year because it, that's, it's just the spacing on the calendar how it works. Uh, they'll, so, they'll nearly always be set that way. So would you say that this is on par or probably the, the best... The best meteor shower of the year, just for the number of meteors that you're going to see. Yeah, it has the highest zenithal hourly rate. A few, about a decade or so ago, the Geminids passed the Perseids in dependability per year. The quadr the quadrantids in January produced a lot, but their peak is very narrow. And what's interesting with this meteor shower too, unlike most of them that hail from a comet, this one uh, they discovered in the 1980s. The source of this one is an asteroid called 32 Phaethon. That mm -hmm. is in, the, and it's actually. It's going to have another, like, less than a tenth of an AU pass by Earth in 2017, like 2018. So they're wondering if that's one of the reasons that we're having this, this asteroid. It, it, it's on a short, they wonder if it's a captured, like, dead nucleus of a comet. You see people call 32 Faith in the rock comet occasionally. But uh, it, it seems mm -hmm. like we're going toward maybe a, a maximum peak here in the 20, early 21st century for this shower. I, I like to compare meteor showers to the 2001 Leonids. Yes. So how, how would you compare sort of where we're at now with this that? This one, the, 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 the Leonid year for me was Kuwait in 1998, but right around that time, the Leonids, uh, they're not going to be that intense. I would estimate when we were watching from dark skies out uh, on uh, El Jabra Air Base in Kuwait was about the zenithal hourly rate, I think, towards sunrise was approaching 1,000 per hour. You were wow. seeing one air we're seeing one every few seconds. It's not going to be that. The the Leonids, the, the 33 cycle year Leonids are the, the king of all meteor showers. Mm -hmm. I, I'm hoping uh, 2033 will be the next, right around that time will be the next one. So it, that's one of the coolest things uh, next to the Northern Lights in Alaska that I've ever seen was that meteor shower. Yeah, mm -hmm. same for me. The one in 2001 was just off the hook. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. Okay, well let's. Uh, we've we've kind of gone around the the horn. Why don't we come back and and start at the beginning? Um, Ramin, let's talk about some uh, nano satellites. Yeah, so um, NASA and, and a bunch of other people have worked on these things. Uh, they're called CubeSats. They're uh, really small. They're a little bigger than a, a Rubik's cube, about four inches on a side. And uh, it seems like they've gotten more and more popular over the past uh, I don't know decade or so. And uh, so people at NASA Ames have uh, developed. Um, these these uh, CubeSat uh, technologies, and they launched them al along with all sorts of other equipment and supplies on that Cygnus spacecraft last weekend. Um, and so what th this mission is for, it's called Nodes, and uh, so there, there's a pair of these CubeSats, of these, these really small satellites, um, and they're, they're going to go up together and try to basically communicate with each other and uh, network with each other. And so it's kind of a, uh, if it works, um, it, it'll be like a proof of concept so that um, eventually, um, soon I think, they're, they're working on a situation where they'd have a bunch of these, more than just two, that would, like a fleet of satellites, or a swarm as they call them, to, uh, to do all sorts of things. So th th it could be like the, the drones of, of, uh, of space or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and so th the nice thing about these CubeSats is that they're, they're relatively inexpensive. The development time is really short, so you, once you get an idea, you can come up with it in a, in a couple years, and... Uh, once you have a, a launch ready, then you can then you can send it out there, and uh, and yeah, so so they they uh, it's they're easier than than say uh, a giant a giant uh, satellite to develop, um, and so if if these swarms if the swarming technology works, then um, there's someone at UC Santa Cruz I talked to who wants to use them to study um, properties of the moon. There's uh, a plan to study um, we weather features in um, on Earth. Also, space weather, if, if they can, say, see um, um, solar flares coming at us, c coming at the Earth, that could be detected pretty quickly. Um, or uh, they, they, I talked to a NASA scientist who had, had an idea to try to use them to, um, to find killer asteroids, uh, you know, 
when they're <laughs> still pretty far away from us. Um, but they have all sorts of ideas. I think one of the really cool missions that uh, that they're planning is uh, one for 2018, um, using a CubeSat with a, a solar uh, solar sail, and and so uh, the solar sail would. Uh, be used as propulsion, and it would go out to an asteroid in the uh, in the asteroid belt, and basically just look at the study the properties of the asteroid. But it's uh, but it, I, I think it seems like NASA, uh, I guess you could say that these uh, cubesats are are taking off, and uh, um, it's not just NASA, also industry and and university scientists are getting into it. And so anyway, th these uh, um, I'm hoping that this this uh, swarming technology works uh, with these telescopes. On, would, um, would this be something students could use? Absolutely. Actually, that's how it started out. Was uh, um, a professor at uh, at Stanford and at uh, California State University Monterey mm -hmm. Bay. I, th I think that's where he's at. Um, they uh, they developed this so that they could work on it with their students, and then uh, some of their students became NASA scientists, and they mm -hmm. continued with it. So uh, so yeah so exactly so it's it's something that students can work on and mm -hmm. actually do an experiment during the course of their studies rather than wait many years for it to come to fruition. Right. I've got a question here. This comes from uh, John Gallant. Uh, what about the space junk with all these cubesats? That's that's a good question. Um, and uh, the, uh, one person I asked about that, uh, an expert on it, um, said that because they're uh, because they're so small, the the risk is actually pretty low. Of course, if if, if space junk, you know, is, is a problem when it when, when it hits you, but um, it's it, the risk is pretty low, and and also many of these, uh, at least the, the missions in lower Earth orbit, and and this would be one of them, is uh, they're designed to to have decaying orbits, as in once they finish their mission, they fall back to Earth, and so it seems like they're they're trying to account for that problem. Uh, I got a question for um, Morgan. This comes from Lionel Ward. Do you have any idea of how deep we would have to dig through the asphalt color colored series dust to reach the layer of briny ice? Presumably, craters would give us better access. Yeah. So the craters, I think, are the key to this, and. The fact that we see these spots almost exclusively inside of relatively deep craters tells us that the ice must be relatively uh, far underneath the surface. Uh, and these craters probably uh, go at least a kilometer down uh, into the surface. Uh, and so, in fact, I don't know if anyone's done this, but a way you could attack uh, an understanding of this problem is to map the size of craters relative to whether or not they have this uh, salt deposits in the bottom. And that would tell you how deep your crater has to be to penetrate down to the point at which uh, you would reach this, this ice layer. But have you got, I mean, are the, are the white spots in the middle of these craters because you're getting impacts and it's excavating down to the, to the salts? Or are you getting, like, you know, inside the craters, the, the ice is sublimating last because it's partly shadow? Uh, you're breaking up on me. I don't think I've caught that question. Oh, I got a. Um, just asking: Is the ice, the salt at the bottom of these craters, is that from, you know, impacts excavating down into the, into the salt layer? I think that's the interpretation that's been advanced: is that the ice could be, in fact, you know, all underneath uh, of theories at a certain layer uh, or a certain depth below the surface. And when your uh, impactor hits, it throws up so much material that it suddenly reveals that mm. uh, at the bottom. And then that ice over time sublimates away and leaves the salt behind. Uh, Elad Avron asks, so Fraser, does the universe now owe you an occultation as well? It sure does. Um, <laughs> I was perfectly positioned here on the west coast of Canada <clears throat> to see the occultation of Venus by the moon in the semi-darkness. It would have been perfect. I could have used my binoculars, watched the whole thing happen, but I was my view was occulted here's, by the Earth. Here's a nighttime occultation of Veldubra in January. It's, it's sometime in next, just next no. month, as a matter of fact. No, that's not, that's not enough. It's not enough, <laughs> David. No, the universe needs to dig deep and get me an occultation of Venus by the Venus, moon. Venus yeah. ones are cold. I'll take a Jupiter see. or a Saturn as well. Yeah, you can see those in the daytime too if you had a bright sky. No, 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 no. Morning darkness. <laughs> that's what I need. Uh, yeah. And it, and if it wants to place it right next to that really bright comet, that would also be there that would go. be a nice bonus, and I would appreciate that. An occultation of a comet would be cool too. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. 
I, is that possible? Can I can I order yeah. that up? Okay, um, right Morgan, now, yeah. let's talk about uh, Akatsuki at Venus. Yeah, so other than the launch of a spacecraft, the most risky part of a mission is the phase called orbital insertion. Uh, and this takes place after your spacecraft has been traveling at extremely high velocity from the Earth to its target of interest, and you now need to slow down uh, to a speed at which you can enter orbit around um, the body you want to study. Um, this requires firing your rocket for an extended period of time um, and for a very precise period of time, usually to within a few seconds or, or a minute or so. Uh, and if you fire it too short uh, to slow down, you'll be going too quickly and you'll fly right past uh, the object that you want to enter orbit. If you uh, fire it too long, you slow down too much, uh, the object's gravity takes over and you crater into the surface rather than uh, achieving orbit. Uh, and this sort of risky part of the mission uh, befell the Japanese spacecraft Akatsuki back in 2010 as it uh, approached Venus uh, traveling from the Earth. Uh, it was supposed to fire its main engine for 12 minutes in order to be captured by uh, Venus. Uh, but instead of 12 minutes, it fired for only three. Uh, and this meant it did not nearly slow down enough in order to uh, enter Venetian orbit, and it flew right past hmm. uh, Venus. Uh, and it turned out that this wasn't just a computer error. The uh, motor had basically broken uh, after three minutes, and they were unable to achieve much thrust from it in tests after it flew, um, flew past Venus. Uh, but some very uh, enterprising engineers uh, realized that at certain points uh, in its new trajectory, wherever that was going to take us, uh, if you fired its maneuvering engines uh, pretty much at their capacity, you could generate enough thrust that uh, Akatsuki would approach Venus again uh, in December of 2015. Uh, and so in, uh, I believe it was in 2012 and 2013, uh, they carried out these uh, engine firings, and earlier this week they approached Venus, fired their engines again, and were effectively uh, captured by, um, by Venus. Uh, and the orbit that this strange uh, maneuver um, led them to enter around Venus is one of the uh, most elongated orbits you'll ever see for a spacecraft. Uh, at its closest, it gets about 400 kilometers from the surface uh, of Venus. But at its largest, it travels more than 440,000 kilometers uh, away from Venus. Uh, and this is obviously a much different orbit than what they initially intended um, to enter in order to carry out their science, and they're not going to be able to go from the orbit they have today to the orbit that they wanted to be on because they had to use up so much of that maneuvering fuel just to make this second capture attempt uh, possible. Uh, they will be able to uh, change the orbit somewhat and kind of have the difference. Um, the other concern that was had going into this uh, final maneuver is that in order to do what they had to do, uh, Akatsuki had to approach much closer to the sun than it was originally designed to handle. Uh, and they weren't sure if the instruments were going to be able to uh, survive the much higher temperatures that uh, the spacecraft reached than, than was originally intended. Uh, and there's five cameras and one other instrument on board uh, this spacecraft. And what they decided to do is uh, point three of those instruments relatively close or relatively facing the sun uh, to sort of absorb the blow. And then the three that were facing away from the sun um, were expected to uh, survive. And so the good news is that those three instruments, in fact, have survived. And I'm going to see if I can screen share here uh, pictures returned by all three of these instruments uh, of Venus. Uh, so here's one of them. Mm -hmm. They have uh, five instruments, uh, five cameras designed to take images at five different wavelengths to probe different uh, chemicals within the atmosphere of Venus, as well as to look at different depths. Uh, so here's the first. Uh, here's a second uh, image taken. Uh, and then finally, this one was taken at a thermal wavelength. Hmm. Um, uh, and all three of these uh, apparently look as they're intended to look, meaning that the, uh, the three instruments survived. Uh, what they don't yet know is whether the other instruments will have uh, survived, and that's what they intend to evaluate in the next couple of months. So they're going to spend uh, basically the next three months in their existing orbit checking out all of their spacecraft systems to see what survived the relatively close encounter to the sun and what didn't. Uh, they weren't able to do this beforehand because in order to save power, they had to put the uh, spacecraft to sleep for this extra four and a half years uh, in space. 
Uh, and then within the next few months, they hope to begin scientific observations in which they'll act basically as a weather satellite for Venus, studying cloud movements uh, and weather systems um, near the top of the Venus clouds. Uh, and they hope to do this for a further two years. Uh, but really, this is all up in the air because they don't have nearly as much uh, propellant for their maneuvering engines as they hope mm -hmm. to have. Uh, and spacecraft are generally designed to survive in space for a finite period of time. Uh, and we often see that they manage to last longer than that. Um, but Akatsuki is already starting basically four and a half years into the hole. And so while they hope that they'll get performance for the next couple of years from both the spacecraft and the instruments, uh, there's no guarantee that'll happen. And right now they're just trying to salvage anything uh, that they can get. Uh, Jax has had a pretty rough time with uh, with the space exploration. They lost the Nozomi spacecraft. Mm -hmm. Uh, they had the Hayabusa, which, you know, had a very similar story about sort of taking much longer and using every trick they could figure out to get it back to, to Earth. Yeah, this so, is not, not the first time that an engine has failed on a JAXA yeah. spacecraft. And I'm sure that uh, in the interim between 2010 and, and now, they've really gone back uh, to square one to evaluate what uh, flaw there is their engine designs have that isn't being experienced by spacecraft launched by uh, the European Space Agency or, or NASA. I, I really, I did look to see if it was somehow related to gyros and it doesn't seem to be. No. So, no. It's, so, it's, so it's possible that this is the one uh, outlier of uh, uh, spacecraft mm -hmm. that it wasn't the gyros that broke on it. That, that orbit I would add to is uh, well over the Earth-Moon distance equivalent. It's like 30% more. I believe the Earth-Moon equivalent distance is 300,000 kilometers, something like that. Yeah, it's it's an amazingly long yeah. orbit. Um, and Ap The apoapsis, or aposynthian, I think is what you would call it. <laughs> yeah, one of the troubles that this orbit is going to give them is that when you have an orbit that is this elongated, um, you move very slowly at the outer part of the orbit, mm -hmm. uh, but you move exceptionally quickly when you're at the part of the orbit close to the planet. Uh, and so the observations that they wanted to make in high detail of cloud features on, on Venus are going to be much more challenging to make now because you can imagine trying to take a, a picture of something uh, standing on the sidewalk versus driving by in a car traveling at 200 miles an hour. Uh, and there's some tricks that you can do to try to account for that, but the bottom line is probably they're going to have a more difficult time making uh, their most high-resolution observations uh, than they originally intended. Uh, so I got a question that just came from uh, Matt Woods, uh, who is a longtime fan of the show, and he says, hey guys, when you write news articles, are you getting your info from press releases, or do you get people informing you of potential news? I started to write articles on space and astronomy this year, and I'm a still bit raw to journalism. I'd say uh, yes to both. Yes to <laughs> well, <laughs> Yes to, I mean, unfortunately, uh, it's mostly yes to the former, which is that we get most, we as journalists, mostly get our news from press releases uh, because they've got a really great facility to get the information out to us. But the downside is is that everybody gets it at the same time. So you don't get any kind of scoop. You are, you know, and that's why everyone, if you're, you know, if you're accustomed to seeing this. Hey, isn't it funny that there was a story on Universe Today and Space.com and in Gadget yeah, yeah. and, mm -hmm. you know, Canada.com all at the same time? That's weird. Uh, that's because we all got the press release and we all thought it was a good yeah, news story and we needed to be a part of it. The best stories... I think the ones that I'm I really have respect for are the ones where someone goes outside of the common press release area and finds a really interesting story that nobody else is talking about. Be it reaching out to a researcher and saying, "Hey, you know, uh, friend of Camille Cartier's, uh, what uh, what interesting projects are you working on? Where can we find aliens next?" And then they'll give you some some news tips, and then you'll follow that up and you'll write a story that nobody else is going to have. So. Those are the most fun to write, too, actually. They're the like, most I fun to write. Really yeah. it, it takes yeah. more time and effort, yeah. but uh, investigative journalism is kind yeah. of a dying art. Yeah. The more yeah. experienced you are, the easier it is to get sort of people right. to talk to you and get along those lines. Yeah, so I think That's if you nice. want to, you know, if anyone's here who wants to be a journalism journalist, uh, space journalist, by all means, you know, jump on the press release train um, because it's going to give you a lot of practice in writing quickly and getting, you know, getting that information and communicating that information. But if you want to set yourself apart, 
you want to write the stories that nobody is writing, that nobody is aware of, and that you've got to, you've absolutely got to to sort of follow your instincts, follow questions that are interesting to you, talk to people, dig stuff up, and then and then chase those down. And the time spent to dig up those stories will sort of pay off down the road when mm -hmm. the stories that you come up with are really well received. So. Can I, say something? Can I say something? One of the things that I do when I get these press releases is if I know them, I go ahead and call them and, or send them email. And a lot of times you get a little, you get railroaded off to another topic, which is kind of cool. So you, you, you've got another, act, you've got another uh, dimension to a press release story we're all getting, but then you've got this other little extra thing, which could give you another story or two as well. That's yeah. what I was going to say. It's just because you're writing off a press release uh, doesn't mean you have to simply reword the mm -hmm. press release. Uh, and the, you know, there's a big difference between reading somebody who reworded the press release and say something that Emily Lakdawalla wrote, where she called five people, uh, and mm -hmm. you know, and it's basically all original work. Uh, mm -hmm. And so just because you got your tip or everybody got their tip from a you know a NASA news post or a, a journal article or something like that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of room to it expand the interpretation of that into a much more fleshed out story. Yeah. Sure. I also I know a lot of researchers that I have talked to who have had their research highlighted by media outlets and things like that. They actually keep a list of a number of science writers and science communicators that they have good relationships with and they'll sometimes reach out and say reach out to those science writers and say right now I'm working on this really interesting story that the astronomical community is pretty interested in, would you like to write about it? And they'll actually approach you after time once you develop those relationships with researchers. It's another great benefit to actually reaching out and talking to the people who are doing the work directly. Yeah. And they're pretty, their hands are pretty tied, though, about what they can say to one person and not say to other people. So, you know, if you're hoping that you can get some kind of inside scoop that nobody else is going to know that they've discovered, you know, planets around Alpha Centauri or whatever, you're not going to get the the scoop from them because in many cases they're obligated to release the news simultaneously to as many people as, as possible so uh, it's a, it's it is tough like I I've been in like I said I've been in this business for you know a couple of you know decade and a half now and I you know very rarely get an, an interesting scoop that is that is that um, uh, unique it's more me digging and sort of following my own instincts and and sometimes a researcher is working on something that's publicly available and they just don't realize that anybody cares that this is super interesting and they just aren't aware and so you know uh, I really like to look through Astro PH through the that's the um, yeah. the, the prepress list that a lot of astronomers use to publish their work and that's you can all that science one, yeah. the astrobiology one yeah, you can pretty much trace if you if you look at say a, a news story that's just come out, you can often trace those stories back to months ago when they were on Astro PH and really interesting ones like people having conversations about you know extrasolar planet discoveries, uh, you know some of this interesting stuff in some of the more theoretical stuff about wormholes and you know black holes and things like that. It was all out there, just nobody took the time to go look at it and think and figure out that it was important. So there's a there's a I hope that helps. And of course we'll publish stuff over at Universe Today. So if you've uh, you know if you want to kick some articles our way, Matt, just uh, just contact me. Um I think we're out of time after that total rabbit hole. So why don't we wrap <laughs> things up? Um cool. So we'll we'll uh, We'll give you the last word, Carolyn. Uh, Dave Dickinson, where do people find out more? Uh, see, this week I was active on my own site, Astro Guys with the Z. I'm Astro Guys with the Z on Twitter. I, was on, I write for the Universe Today. I contribute to Sky and Telescope Online. List of Soar. I write my own science fiction that's up on Amazon. I'm offering a free chapter. There's a new chapter from the Syzygy Gambit and Solar Winds Universe that's up. And I'm also working on the astronomical events for 2016 for Universe Today by the end of this year, it will be up. I, I might do a brief periscope after this and just kind of give a teaser of what's going on in 2016, just uh, for something to talk about. If you haven't sort of seen Dave do this every year, this is a phenomenal piece of work. This is a monster <laughs> and a I tremendous start, amount of... I only start like in July, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have it, to. Is, yeah. it is all of the big things that you're going to be able to see in the night sky. You know, you, you're all excited about the Geminids right now, if you had followed David's story, you would have known in January 
that this was going to be something you should set your calendar to. So it's, it's 101 blog posts that I'll be writing next year. So yeah. Exactly. Wait a minute. Does you just you just schedule all your blog posts? I, I just look at that and I just say, hey, here's what I'm writing about this week. So there's 101 things. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Kimberly, where do people find out more? Uh, you can find out more by checking out my website, www.kimberlycartier.org. That's where I keep a mostly up to date view of what I am actually working on for my research. And if you can, uh, if you would like to, you can follow me on Twitter at Astro Kim Cartier. Morgan. Well, if you're in the uh, Boulder, Denver metro area this evening, you should swing by the Fisk Planetarium where I'll be hosting uh, my last show of the season uh, in our series Above and Beyond Cosmic Conversations where we've got a great speaker who's going to take us on a tour of some of the hottest vacation destinations in the galaxy. Um, <laughs> if you're uh, not interested in that, you could also follow me on Twitter at Morgan Renberg uh, or visit my website morganrenberg.com. Are these talks available on the internet somewhere? That would be pretty cool to watch. I recorded one of them, and we're still trying to figure out how to record well in the it's so dark in the in the dome. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, oh, it's really challenging. Right, yeah. and not have some weird looking like night scope. Yeah, yeah, with everyone with these glowing green so eyes. We're yeah. we're working on uh, we're working on it. I per I periscoped one, and it didn't work very well. Try oh, okay, yeah. Hmm. I, I'm sure Carolyn would have some opinions on how to how to get uh, you know a planetarium show output in a way that people could watch it on the internet. Um, I'll let you guys talk after this. Uh, Ramin, where do people find out more? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ramin Skiba, and uh, you can look up, up my writings uh, and what I've been working on lately at RaminSkiba.net. Got links to including that uh, to a bunch of my stories, including the one at, on Science Magazine. Next week, I'm going to be at the American Geophysical Union meeting, and uh, on, on Monday I'll be covering some planetary sciences uh, uh, research, and then there'll be some other non-planetary stuff later in the week, but if you're interested in that too, uh, just uh, just look it up and uh, and you can read it there. That sounds great. All right. Uh, of course, I'm Fraser Kane. You can check out my website, Universe Today. We're putting a lot of effort into our Instagram feed, so if you haven't already, you should follow us on Instagram, where I've been posting a few times every day some really cool pictures mm. that I like and big descriptions of them, so um, check that out. Uh, and as promised, Carolyn, we'll give you the last word. Once again, where, where do people find out more? You can find out more about me. I'm, I tweet at, at, at SpaceWriter. My blog is thespacewriter.com. Uh, I work for Loch Ness Productions, which is LochNessProductions.com. You can read my other work at Space.About.com. And for Morgan, I got started at Fisk Planetarium, and I got married there. Wow. Oh, that Put is that on my list. Yeah. So, <laughs> so as always, we uh, definitely want to thank the the Weekly Space Hangout crew, the WSH crew. These are the dedicated fans who really help produce this show, pick our guests, and um, and help really coordinate a lot of the activities. So if you haven't already, go to Google+, search for the WSH crew, and join this amazing community. So to uh, on behalf of all of the panelists, thank you so much for watching us again this week, and we'll see you all next Friday. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>